Well, welcome back to Have You Seen God's Supernatural Power Lately? Uh, we are talking about why don't we see so much of God's supernatural power today? Should we? Can we? Uh, I believe we can, and I'm trying to show you how. Uh, I believe that God is supernatural. He created this universe. Jesus Christ is his son. He is supernatural. So when we begin a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we're inviting the supernatural God into our lives. Naturally, then, we should expect to see supernatural in our lives. Laura was diagnosed with progressive multiple sclerosis. Uh, Dr. Harold a Adolf, uh, a surgeon who'd done like 25,000 surgeries in the Chicago area, said, I have never seen a patient more seriously ill. Uh, Dr. Thomas Marshall, her internist, who's been an internist for about 30 years, uh, he described her as a girl who was a gymnast in high school, played the flute in the orchestra, uh, and then her life began to fall apart. She started to trip and bump into walls. She couldn't grab the, the bars in gymnastics. And that's when uh, her parents took her to Mayo Clinic and they confirmed the diagnosis, progressive multiple sclerosis. Over the years after that, things got progressively worse for her. Uh, her lungs stopped working. Uh, one of the diaphragms just shut down, it became non-functional. The other lung was only half capacity. So she had many hospital stays with pneumonia, breathing problems. Uh, she went legally blind, couldn't read at all. Uh, she'd look at other people and they were like gray objects. Um, her urination stopped working so they had to put a catheter in her bladder. Uh, they had to put a feeding tube into her stomach. Uh, her stomach got grotesquely large because her intestine muscles were not working. Uh, she spent most of her time in bed. Uh, she uh, couldn't uh, walk, and uh, so she was kind of like a pretzel, uh, all into a ball. And her, her hands were so deformed, they practically touched her, her wrist and her, her feet were, were cocked constantly in the downward uh, position. In 1981, she hadn't walked for seven years. Somehow someone got wind of her condition. Uh, Mayo Clinic had said, you know, there's just no more hope for her except pray, pray for a miracle. And uh, uh, so someone called in to Moody Bible Institute radio station in Chicago and encouraged people to pray for Laura and calls went out and uh, letters started coming in. About 450 letters from different Christians came into her church saying, we're praying for Laura. Well, one day, this was Pentecost Sunday, 1981, her aunt came over to see her uh, in her hospital room and uh, uh, brought these letters and began to read some of these letters from people who were praying for her. Two friends also joined them and all of a sudden, Laura heard a voice, clear voice, a man's voice behind her. And there was nobody else in the room. And then she heard the voice again, my child, get up and walk. And her friends could tell she was agitated, so they put the, the plug back in her uh, throat so she could talk. And she says, you may not believe this, but God just talked to me and told me to get up and walk. Quick, go get my parents. I want them here with me. And so they rushed to get her family, and they came in, and she jumped out of bed. She pulled off her oxygen tube, and she was standing there on legs she hadn't stood on for seven years. And she could breathe again, and her, her arms and legs became free and, and stretched out and normal. Her mom fell down on her knees and felt her legs, and she said, Barbara, you have muscles again. And her dad took her and waltzed around with her in the family room. The next day she went to see her doctor, internist, Dr. Marshall. As he saw her coming down the hallway, he said, it was so weird, it was like seeing an apparition. He said to her, this is medically impossible. I don't know what to say, but go out and live your life. 
She got married. She's been married at this point for 36 years to a minister. She's been serving people. The two doctors, Dr. Adolph and Dr. Marshall, have written about her in books, in articles, uh, saying what an amazing occurrence it was. And Dr. Marshall uh, said this, um, I have never witnessed anything like this before or since and considered it a rare privilege to observe the hand of God performing a true miracle. So what do you think? Do you think this is an exaggeration? Uh, do you think this was a medical anomaly? Or do you think this is a divine intervention by God to heal this lady? So why don't you pause for a moment and just talk among your group. Do you think this happened really? Uh, do you think stuff like this can happen or not? Maybe, be, please be honest. Maybe you don't believe this stuff can happen. So share in your group. Okay, to talk about God's supernatural power in our lives today, I want to look at an Old Testament passage, 2 Kings chapter 5. If you have a Bible, turn to it. If you've got a cell phone, uh, turn to it in there. Uh, a man named Naaman was a great military leader in Syria. He was the second most powerful man in Syria next to the king. Uh, now, Naaman was commander of the army of the kings of Aram. He was a man of a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Ancients were repulsed by leprosy. So this tells us that he was so respected by the king that the king tolerated his leprosy because he saw him as indispensable to his kingdom. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the, pro the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosies. In one of his conquests, Naaman had taken a, a girl from Israel uh, to become one of his slaves, and she had seen Elisha heal people, and so she knew that uh, God could heal Naaman. Naaman went to his master, that's the king, and told him what the girl from Israel had said. Just as people today will rush to Mexico or some other country to get a treatment that is not approved here in the United States, uh, he was asking for permission to take leave to go to Israel. The king of Aram says, go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. That would be the equivalent of about $100,000 today. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. Now, the king had rejected God. He didn't believe in the power-working God of Israel. He hadn't experienced any supernatural power in his life. Like many of us today, he had not uh, experienced this kind of power. Uh, so he thought this was just a trick by the king of Syria to kind of pick a fight so he could go to war with him. Elisha got wind of this. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Elisha wasn't impressed with this proud general, uh, so he didn't even bother to come out to say hello to him. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over my leprosy and cure me. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. And Naaman was angry. He was angry that Elisha didn't come out to say hi to him. And he was angry that he had to dunk in the Jordan River. He considered the rivers back in Syria to be superior. And uh, 
But God wanted it to be an act of faith using uh, the Jordan River as, as symbolizing that it was the God of Israel healing him, not the gods of Syria. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan. I think he went kicking and screaming. He didn't think anything was going to happen. He thought this was idiotic. He went down, he dunked five, six times. About the sixth time he's thinking, yeah, just what I thought. Nothing's going to happen. This is stupid. Then when he dunked the seventh time, as the, as the man of God had told him, his flesh was restored and being clean, became clear like that of a young boy. Then Th Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. All right, what do you learn from uh, reading uh, this account? Uh, why don't you share with your group members uh, kind of what did you learn from this? Uh, if you have your journals and you've come uh, with them filled in, then share your answers. Uh, what more can we learn from this? Uh, if they're not filled in, I see nothing wrong with just taking a Bible, your cell phone Bible, and uh, filling out the, the journal right together. And then be sure and pray with each other. Uh, some of you are looking for miracles from God. You're facing some big stuff and you need His supernatural power. So ask for that.